Julie. So, Well, my name is Brett Day. I'm the youth and children's pastor. So if I haven't met you yet, uh, welcome to First Baptist Surfside. If you are new with us or relatively new, I want to ask you to fill out the guest uh, information card. It's in the pew rack right in front of you. Um, and then when the ushers take up the offering later on in the service, you can just drop it right on in there, and we'll get some more information about you, know how to best follow up with you, um, and all that. So I want to welcome you to our church. Just a few announcements before we begin our time of worship. First is uh, Sunday nights, uh, resuming tonight from 6 to 7.30. Uh, one slight change, though. Um, when you enter on Sunday nights, um, please enter through the main entrance on 16th Avenue North. And we're asking everyone to now park on this side of the parking lot, the sanctuary side of the parking lot, because the other side will be overrun with teenagers. And we don't want you to hit them. We don't want them to hit your car, vice versa. So it's, it's good for all of us. If you park on the sanctuary side, we'll have some games set up out here for the youth. Um, Discover First Baptist Surfside Lunch. That is a Discover Lunch for new uh, or prospective church members. So if you were interested in joining our church, or you are just interested in more information about our church, I want to invite you to the Discover Surfside lunch. That is next Sunday after this service. So around 11.45 next Sunday in the Fellowship Hall. Um, if you want to come, you have to reserve a spot so we can order lunch for you. So call the church office sometime this week to register for next Sunday's Discover lunch. Uh, lastly, if you are in youth ministry, if you're in middle school or high school or know someone in that age range, we're going bowling not this Saturday, but next, March 27th, at the Surfside Bowling Alley. So meet there at 6 o'clock, get picked up at 8 o'clock. Um, dinner provided, it's kind of like a, a, a group deal where we're doing dinner, uh, bowling for two hours and all that. Last thing, uh, Easter Sunday, we are going to have three services. Now listen closely because of the times. The first one is going to be an inside service at 7.30 a.m., I can hear the, uh, I can just sense the collective non-audible gasp. Inside service at 7.30. Drive-in service at 9 as normal, and then also as normal this service inside at 10.30. We expect the 10.30 indoor service to be the most crowded with, with, with guests. Um, and with the pews kind of strung off like they are, our capacity is quite limited. Therefore... If any of you are able slash willing to either attend the drive-in or the 7.30 service, then we're asking you to do that to make room for guests because, you know, Easter is when, you know, the house gets packed with guests. Um, and so if you're able and or willing to attend one of the earlier services to free up your spot in this service, we're asking you to do that. It would be appreciated. Um, all right, that was a lot, but I'm going to invite Lindsay Steelman up to talk about our upcoming Easter event. Good morning. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so before that 730 service, we want to get you warmed up and ready to worship. So the Saturday before Easter is our Easter extravaganza. We loved our uh, trunk or treat this year so much that we are going to follow the same basic premise, but for Easter. So we talked about this a little bit last week, but I wanted to flesh it out, make it a little bit more um, welcoming. It is not going to be hard. This is going to be an easy, a really fun way to do what Jesus called us to do, which is to share the gospel. We're going to actually give you a script that you can share. We are going to have... 13, 14-ish cars parked just like we do for Trunk or Treat. We're going to rope it off just like we did for Trunk or Treat this year to make it safe and booking uh, slots so that it won't be overwhelming. We'll have a steady flow of traffic. We're basing our, our theme on the resurrection eggs. If you've ever seen those, there's 12 eggs. Each egg has a little trinket in it that tells a part of the Holy Week story. So we're starting with the donkey and riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and we go all the way through the cru crucifixion. And our last car gets to be gloriously empty because we will be celebrating that the tomb is also empty. And we get to share that with those coming onto our campus so we strongly ask you to sign up for a trunk. We have lots of opportunities to do the trunks. We will be, as a children's team, more than happy to help you decorate if that's not your thing. 
because this is a little bit, your decoration should sort of go along with the theme of your trunk, which you can sign up for specific ones. We will be more than happy to help you with that. We are providing the eggs, we're providing the candy, um, and we can, again, help you with the decorations as well. We will hand you a script, so you don't have to dream up what you're going to say. It'll probably take you 30 minutes to a minute to say what it is that you're going to say as part of the Easter story as um, our guests go around the trunks. Get lots of candy. We need a good 400 pounds of candy. Sounds like a lot, but it actually will get distributed, and we want those children to leave really excited about the not only what they're carrying away in their hands, but also the message that they're carrying away as well. We are, again, doing the sign-up time, so we do need registration help. And we are roping off again, so we need some setup help as well. So our trunks, we would like to be in place around 9. The event is only 10 to 12, so a little bit shorter than Trunk or Treat was. And we don't expect quite as big a crowd as we had in October because it's just a little bit of a different um, vibe that we have going on, but what a great message to be able to share and what an easy way to do it. We're going to give you everything that you need. So I'll be in the lobby after the service. Feel free to come sign your name up for any and all opportunities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so just to reiterate, if you're interested in serving, whether by volunteering your car uh, or you know, helping with the registration or some other way, then please see Lindsay after service, and she would be glad to find a spot for you. Um, so let's pray, and we'll begin our time of worship. <clears throat> Father, we are so thankful that when you saved us, you did not only save us vertically to yourself, you also saved us horizontally. Lord, we are now reconciled to one another through the death of Jesus Christ and through his resurrection. And Lord, I think of Ephesians 2, 13, which says that those who were far off can now be brought near by the blood of Christ, who is himself our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Lord, I thank you that now in Christ there is no reason for hostility. There is no reason for superficial surface level divisions among us. Instead, we can be one in Christ, just as Christ is one with the Father. And so, Lord, as we worship you now, I pray that we worship you with one voice, that we would worship you as one, that we would not look on as spectators watching a performance, but that we would engage as worshipers before the throne of heaven. God, thank you that your throne to us is now a throne of grace in Christ rather than a throne of judgment where we can approach you boldly because of the work of the Spirit within us. We thank you for all these privileges and benefits we get by being your children, Lord. And we thank you that it comes to us um, at no cost to ourselves, but at the cost of the very life and death of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for who you are and for what you've done for us. Humble us now and prepare us for worship. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and bless the Lord and worship his holy name in song.
the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore yes the Lord of our soul oh my soul worship his This time last year, we had on the calendar a Sunday by which we were going to have a time of dedication for our two-year-old daughter, Danielle, but then it was a year ago to this day, March 14th, that the first COVID case was announced in Horry County. March 15th of last year was actually our last normal Sunday that we had. I remember my dad, that was the last time he worshiped with us, and he had canceled his services because it was more cases there in Richland County, and I thought, well, man, we won't have to do that. Here we are a year later. What a year that has been. And so today, we are going to have a time of commitment for Danielle, our two-year-old daughter. And so this morning, what is going to take place is Kelly and I are going to come before you and and commit. Commit to raising our daughter, Danielle, in a Christ-exalting home. And so really, this isn't a child dedication. This is a parent commitment time. Because what we are committing is that we recognize that Danielle is a very precious child, but at two, she has a sin nature. You may see some of that. It's hard to script a two-year-old. But she has a sin nature. And she desperately, her greatest need in life is to, at an early age, give her life to Jesus Christ. And so we are committing here, not as a way of salvation. This doesn't play any part in her salvation whatsoever. This is merely us committing before you and the Lord that we will raise her in a Christian home. And really, to me, there's three things we're doing here today. We're celebrating her life. Because in Scripture, it says in Psalm 139 that you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We're celebrating God's gift. We are also recognizing the role of the parent. Because God has orchestrated and ordained the family unit to be His primary way that ministry takes place. But then also, we are praying that God would, at a very young age, through our example, through your example in love in her life, would give her life to Christ and would use her in her life to serve Him and to bring others to a saving knowledge in Christ. And so today I've asked my dad, uh, Pastor Greg Sweet, if he would come up and lead us during this time. And then afterwards, her other grandfather, Danny Allen, is going to pray for her. So this time Danielle is going to come on out, Jason and my wife Kelly.
to make that promise and not honor that promise. And so before Danielle pours the whole jug, uh, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead uh, and want to share. And Nathan actually put the wrong paper in the last year, so I've got to go back. <laughs> Myself and Lisa are very proud of you. The pot of faith was passed to us by our parents. And long before you were even thought of, we prayed for you. We sought to set the example of Christ before you and hand the pot of faith to you. Now that that baton has been passed to you, we pray it will be passed to your children and to future generations.
stand now and sing the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Kelly and myself, we just want to say thank you for our church family, even through the ups and the downs, literally. Um, we thank you. Um, I know as Kelly and I were just talking out there, we we're blessed to have you, that you love us, the real us, um, no matter what is going on in life, you love us well as a church family, and that means more than you'll ever know. And so on behalf of me and my family, we thank you for being such a loving and supporting church family to us. Today we're going to be continuing in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 7, 1 through 23, and just simply considering the idea of a sovereign Savior. Luke chapter 7. In science, we are told about the law of entropy. Entropy is this simple idea that the natural world is constantly going from an order, a state of order to a state of disorder. It's what happens when you pour your coffee in the morning and it starts out very hot, but very quickly it loses its heat. That, that heat, that energy is dispersed. What was in order is now dispersed. And certainly when we look around our world, it seems like chaos is the appropriate term. I mean, when you consider all of the complexity of nature and the created universe, I mean, even just this afternoon, if you were to leave here go down to the beach and just take in that very complicated ecosystem just there at the beach. You see the waves ebbing and flowing, the tide coming in and out, and with each wave, so many millions of, sands of or grains of sand are being washed to and fro. 
You see all the people, all of the birds, all of the animals, the crabs, the fish, all of those things working together. When even you just consider that, but you multiply that by the entire world, even the, the billions of galaxies in our universe, and all of the complexity there, it is sometimes way too much to comprehend. But then when you consider also not just the complexity of, of nature, but also the complexity of life, it makes you think even more. Have you ever just for a moment stopped and realized that you are not the center of human existence? I know for me sometimes just simply leaving my home, driving here in the morning, just a 10 minute drive, sometimes I am just blown away by even just thinking of passing just a few hundred other cars on that drive. But each one of those cars represents a life, a family, struggles, dreams, desires, jobs, an entire life. And then when you multiply that by 7.7 billion people with all of the things going on in our world and people trying to get ahead and world powers and politics and wars, it certainly would humble any of us to think that way. But not just the complexity of nature or of life, but when you consider the complexity of your own life, I know for me sometimes it feels like I'm trying to balance all of these things. I'm trying to balance my, my job, I'm trying to balance my family and bills and concerns, health issues, all of these things in life that, that we balance and sometimes it just feels like some of it's going to slip and crash to the ground. So I would submit chaos is an actually an appropriate word when we look at what we perceive as human life. However, the Bible is almost like when you go to the eye doctor and they change the lens and that lens helps us to take that which is blurry and all of a sudden it becomes clear. The Bible is almost like that lens that helps us see that which is perceived as chaos is actually perfect order. Today what we are going to see is that behind all of it is a sovereign God that is willing and working all of the created order to His perfect plan. Now, I want to be honest with you. As I prepared to preach this sermon, it was very intimidating for me. It's very intimidating for me for any time I try to wrap my mind around a sovereign God. Because my fear is that today, I won't do it justice. That I won't do the sovereignty of God justice. But then, that's when I realize I don't care how well I explain things, how eloquent I am this morning, I will never do the sovereignty of God justice. And I would submit to you that's a great thing. That's a beautiful thing. Because who are we to think that if our brains are almost the size of a fruit, that we in our finite capacities could fully understand and comprehend a fully sovereign, a fully infinite God? And I would actually argue that if we could fully understand Him and completely comprehend who God is and His sovereignty, then He wouldn't be worth worshiping. But the very fact that we cannot comprehend Him fully means that He transcends all human creation. So today, I don't have all the answers. And I'm okay with that. Instead, we are brought face to face with a God who is sovereign. And my challenge to you this morning is to not think that you have to have all the answers about God, but to instead be like today if you did go out to the beach and you just simply stopped and sat and took in with your finite all the vastness and majesty of God's creation. And I would argue that when we do that with the sovereignty of God and just sit in all of who He is, that it is that all, not the answers, that are truly life transforming. So let's look at the sovereignty of God this morning. Luke chapter 7, the first 10 verses we see that Jesus Himself is sovereign over life itself. Look at verse 1. After He had finished all His sayings in the hearing of the people, He entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, 
Do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So here we see, turning the page from chapter 6 to chapter 7, Jesus has ended his preaching, his message to his disciples, and he enters into Capernaum, and there he is met by some very interesting messengers, Jewish elders. Now to this point, most of the Jews had rejected Jesus. But more than that, what makes this even more interesting is that overall they might have rejected Christ, but the Jews especially did not like the Romans. Why? Because they viewed them as their political oppressors during that day. So here we see the Jews asking Jesus to come to the aid of a Roman officer. You see, a centurion was a Roman military officer that had roughly 100 men, 100 soldiers under his authority. Therefore, he was powerful, he was authoritative, and he was very influential. But what I want you to see is that through the text, we see that this is not a normal centurion by every means. There's there's many things that stand out about this centurion. Number one, it says that he cares for his servant. Verse two, this servant is highly valued. You see, this was a very rare thing for a Roman officer to have compassion over such a lowly slave. You see, this slave could easily have been replaceable and just viewed as kind of a cog in the wheel and Whatever rights he had was only given by this centurion anyways. Yet, he cares for him. So as a quick aside, I just want to ask you, if you are in a position of authority, do you view those that are under your authority just for the dollar value that they bring to you as just a replaceable cog on the wheel, or do you care for their souls? Do you recognize that God has given you whatever authority you may have and that those under you are watching you and you have an opportunity by how you demonstrate authority over them to show the example of Christ? By the way that you lead them, do you show them that the dollar is king or that Jesus is king? He cared for those that were under Him. He cared for their soul. Also, we see in the text, He cares for for the Jews. Again, normally, Romans and Jews, they did not see eye to eye. But notice, these Jews, they have nothing but kind words to say about this Roman centurion. They say that he has been worthy to do this, verse 4. Why? Because he loves our nation. He built our synagogue. So, nothing but kind words from the Jews to this centurion. And also, though, I would say this. What stands out more than any of these things is that he is a man of great power that shows great humility. Jesus begins that journey from Capernaum to the centurion's house. He's met by the friends. And in verse 6, it says, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. The Jews said this man is worthy, and the man himself says, no, I'm not worthy. It's not that he doesn't have power. No, the text is clear. He has power and he knows it. You see, the issue is that not that he has power, it's that he's not puffed up by that power. He has power, but he recognizes that Jesus is more powerful than he is. Verse 7, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to no or I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And you see, we're not told how, but as a result, in verse 10, we see Jesus willing that this man be healed. Notice Jesus doesn't go and touch the man. He doesn't even go and speak 
to the man. No, somehow Jesus, showing his sovereignty, shows that merely willing that this man be healed. And he is healed. You see, we have this centurion. He has power. He has money. He has position. And the Bible warns that all of those things, in and of themselves, can be very dangerous things. Yet we see that the issue isn't money. It's not power. It's an issue of the heart. It's an issue of the heart. He recognizes that he has power, but he recognizes that Jesus is more powerful. He had built the synagogue, yet recognizes that Jesus is the one worthy of worship. This man reigned, but he recognizes that Jesus is sovereign. Sovereign. That he reigns over those that reign. So, As we come to a text like this, I would say there's certain questions we have to wrestle with. Mainly, what is the main idea that Luke is trying to communicate to us? Is the main idea now that you and I as reading this, we can expect God to heal us in the same way Jesus healed the servant? Because certainly it it shows that God can and does heal miraculously. And we believe that. We believe that he is the great physician. He can, and even to this day, still heals miraculously. However, just because he can heal does not mean that automatically he will heal in this life. And I would actually submit that it is dangerous for us if we cling to a miraculous healing of some kind without recognizing that God has also given us hospitals, and doctors, and medicine. You see, utilizing healthcare is not anti-God. No, we should utilize those things and then recognize that they are simply evidence of His grace. And say, God, thank you. Thank you that we live in a time where you have blessed us in such a great way. So you see, our faith isn't that we think or know that God is automatically going to heal us every time we ask. No, our faith is that we know that He can and sometimes does do that, but our faith is even greater that if he chooses not to, he has a much greater purpose in mind. So the purpose of this text isn't that God is going to heal us. The purpose is here is the one who is able to heal. Here is the one that is sovereign over the sickness. Here is the one who is sovereign over life itself. Here we are confronted with a life-altering truth, the sovereignty of God. To be sovereign means that He has the right and the authority to reign over all of creation, but that He has the power and the authority to see it through. He is sovereign, and I would actually argue that it is very difficult to read the Bible and not be absolutely blown away by the fact that God is, in fact, sovereign. Psalm 135, 6, Whatever I please... I do. In heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the depths. Job 42, 2. No purpose of mine can be thwarted. Psalm 115, 3. Our God is in the heavens. And He does all that He pleases. That He is sovereign. That what seems to be chaos is really a perfectly orchestrated symphony that is guided and directed by the sovereign hand of God. Now we recognize every piece of creation is guided by His hand and that no one or no thing can thwart His purposes. So we go back to that complexity issue. And we think about the complexity of nature and recognize we can't wrap our mind around all of nature. Yet Scripture says that He was the one that placed each star in the heavens and He knows them by name. That the reason why the ocean stops there and not right here is because God said stop there. That he was the one that dressed the lilies of the field. And even Charles Spurgeon says it this way. He says, if you've ever been sitting in your living room and you see the, the light cascading in and you see those particles of dust floating there in the air, and you think, man, am I really breathing all that in? Spurgeon said that each one of those particles of dust float there in their place and dance in the air directed by God's hand. That he is sovereign to that level over all of creation. Also, consider the complexity of life. Though, yes, there are 7.7 billion people in the world, but Scripture says He knows them by name. 
that they were fearfully and wonderfully made, that He knows the color of their eyes, He knows the number of hairs on their heads, He knows all of their dreams, all of their desires, all of their issues, all of their shortcomings. He knows and He cares for them. Proverbs 16.33 The lot, or the dice, is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. And we know through Scripture that what man means for evil, God means for good. That He is working all things out. And so, as you even consider the complexity in your own life, it is not a cliche. I would say it is a life-defining truth that Romans 8.28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. You see, we need to recognize that, yes, God has a perfect plan for your life. But we need to remember that that is His plan and not our own. And sometimes His perfect plan does not align with what we think our perfect plan is. We are the pot, He is the potter. So who are we to say what the potter should make us into and use our lives for? In the good times, but also in the bad. Now, I understand. As I talk about the sovereignty of God, probably a million questions rise to the surface. Some I share with you. If God is sovereign, then what is our part in salvation? Because I would submit that Scripture clearly indicates that we have a choice. We have a free will in accepting or rejecting Christ and our salvation. Also, if God is sovereign, why allow evil to happen in the first place? If God is sovereign, then why allow my loved one to go through cancer and to struggle with this sickness? If He is sovereign, then why those things? I would say Scripture gives us some clues. But you see, the older I get and the more I know God, the more I know that I don't know. That I don't have all the answers. And I'm okay with that. You see, for me, it's to not know all the answers to all of life's questions, but instead is to simply ground my life in a sovereign and loving God. You see, it's not for me to know. It's for me to trust. To trust in His plan and not my own because God is not a God that is merely meant to be analyzed and understood. No, He is a God that is meant to be worshipped and revered above all else. It's not for us to know. It is for us to trust. Because ask yourself, which would be better? Would it be better for me to say that things like COVID-19 was not part of God's plan? It caught him off guard, and he's been running to plan B ever since. He didn't will this. He he was simply caught off guard by it, because if that's the case, then I would argue that he is powerless to work in it. But instead, to be able to say yes. In his infinite wisdom, God allowed COVID-19. It was part of his plan, and therefore, if he allowed it, he is sovereign over it, and therefore, he has the ability to work in it and end it. And if he doesn't end it, then he has use for it for his purposes, even if we cannot comprehend those purposes. So, the point, here is the God who is sovereign. The question, though, is how do we respond to that truth? Because what stands out about this centurion, notice, Jesus doesn't marvel at his religion. Jesus doesn't marvel at his success. No, what does he marvel at? His faith. He didn't know all the answers, but he had faith in what Christ could do and in his ability. So, we recognize that this man had all of the things of this world had to offer, yet recognize that he was still unworthy. So I would actually submit to you that the defining question of your life, the most important question that you have to answer this morning is, what do you think about Jesus? And at the top of that question is, do you understand that He is the sovereign God of this universe? Jesus is sovereign over life. But notice, the text continues, and secondly, not only is He sovereign over life, what we see starting in verse 11 is that Jesus is sovereign over death. He's sovereign over life, but He's also sovereign over death. Look at verse 11. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. 
As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. and She was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the coffin, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. So here we see Jesus. He's going to the next town over, and as he goes to that town, he sees from the gates a large crowd. This crowd is on their way as a funeral procession to go and bury the dead. But notice, the focus isn't necessarily on the procession. The focus isn't even on the man who died necessarily, but in the crowd is a woman. And in our language today, she would have been wearing black, and her eyes would have been raw from wiping the tears for so long. This man that had died was her son. Notice, her only son. And what makes matters worse is that the text says that not only had her son, her only son passed away, but she was a widow. Which means, especially in that time, she was helpless. She had zero social standing and had almost no way to provide for herself. This woman was desperate. So look at verse 13. Jesus had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Don't skip over that. This is profound. The God of heaven who is sovereign over the entire created universe is also not so lost in the big picture that he does not also still care about the finite details of your life. He has compassion on her. It's almost as if you've ever gone on an airplane or you've flown. As you take off from the runway and you get higher and higher and you get that, that, that large eye view, of, that higher eye view of all the things of the world and you see that which seems so big now seems so infinitely small. The people become ants. You can barely see the cars. The buildings even begin fading out of view. But recognizing that even though God has such a view, if not higher, He still cares about each one of those little that perhaps through human history that we in our lives, we're just a little blip on the radar. We're a little speck, yet He still cares. He still knows. And He still has the power to intervene. You see, for Him to say to her, do not weep, but not have the power to do something about it would have been incredibly unloving. But what we see is verse 14. He goes, He touches the coffin. Now, picture the scene. At that moment, the Jews, they would have likely gasped. Because in the Old Testament law, to touch a coffin or touch a dead body would have meant that you were ceremonially unclean. Yet, what we see, Jesus touches death, and death has no power over him. Jesus touches death, and death was the one who lost. Look at verse 14. He touches the coffin, and verse 14 says, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up. And began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Now, this compassion, this goodness is absolutely essential for us to understand the sovereignty of God. Because, think about it, if God was sovereign and not good, that would be a most terrible thing. If God could will anything that He so chose but was not governed by the character of His goodness, that would be a most unthinkable thing. Providence, I would argue, is when we take His sovereignty and we wed it with His goodness. That yes, He has the right and the authority to reign. He has the power to bring it to fruition. But it is guided through His providential goodness so that all things are working for His perfect plan. All things are for His glory and also for our good. Therefore, in our lives, we trust that the good and the bad are good. Why? Because even the bad He is using to accomplish His purposes. The compassion here 
is merely a commercial. It's a commercial for the compassion that He would show us later on the cross. Because you see, because of sin, death has reigned since Adam. Death is an unnatural, most terrible thing. It's an unnatural reality. When you experience someone in your family that has died, a loved one, there is something within you that shouts, this is not right. This isn't how it should be. And Scripture would agree that that's not how it should be. That it's an unnatural reality. And like this widow here, we are daily confronted with the reality of death, and we are utterly helpless over it. We have no ability to do anything about it on our own. But notice, what I find most interesting is this. She had lost her son, her only son. Her only son. Notice that is the exact same phrase used in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, Jesus had great compassion on this Son because He was the only Son of God that would go to the cross and would pay the just wrath of God that we deserve so that at the hand of a sovereign God we might be reconciled through His death. Through Christ's death, death has died. Death has been defeated. That for us who put our faith and trust in Him, we would not experience that second death, but we would have eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The answer, death is swallowed up in victory. Christ is sovereign over life, but He's also sovereign over death. The question that I need to leave you with here at the end is this. Will we rest in Christ's sovereignty? That's the question we are faced with starting in verse 18. Notice, the disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now I want you to know, I am so glad that this is in the Bible. Because news of Jesus reaches John in a jail cell. This is John the Baptist. And it seems that since we last left him earlier in the Gospel of Luke, things have not been well for him. There he is in a jail cell. Now remember, this is the one that through his mother's womb leapt when Jesus came to his home. In the womb, he leapt for Christ. He rejoiced even in the womb. He had spent his entire life pointing others in the wilderness that the Messiah was coming and that it would be Christ. When he saw the Messiah coming, he shouted, Behold the Lamb. And then he was the one that, that baptized God himself, Jesus himself, and he heard the voice of God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now in a jail cell, John seems to be doubting. John seems to be questioning Jesus, you say that you're here to set the captive free. But here I am rotting in prison. I've spent my whole life reading the Old Testament of a Messiah that would come to vanquish our enemies and establish His kingdom. This isn't how I saw it playing out. I saw it happening one way, Jesus, but now it's happening this way. Are you the Messiah? Or should we be looking for someone else? I'm glad this is in the Bible. Because I think it shows us that even the strongest heroes of the faith struggle. Sometimes even doubting. So if you today, if you struggle, if sometimes those mountaintops of faith seem to slide into the valleys of doubt, you're in good company. If you sometimes recognize that one day your faith is so strong that you can move mountains, but the next day it is almost as if that one Stand of doubt is all it needs to weigh you down. You're in good company. Sometimes our faith is so strong that we can almost, it seems like, reach out and touch God. And then there are other days, God, where are you? You're in good company. Because notice, verse 20. And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who was to come, or... 
shall we look for another? In that hour He healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind He bestowed sight. And He answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Question. Is it a sin to doubt? Answer, yeah. It is a sin when we doubt because we are questioning the character and truth of who God is and what He has told us. But notice, Jesus does not condemn him in his doubt. He doesn't just come with a heavy hand and crush him in his doubt. Notice in the text, Jesus gives him even greater sight. Jesus puts on a full display of his power and removes all doubt that John had. You see, it's okay, I think, to question. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to to wrestle. But my challenge is, is do not allow that to be the reason that you turn and walk away. Make that the reason that you pursue Christ with an even greater fervor. Notice, what led John to despair? It seems as that he was allowing his circumstances, and everything going on in his life to dominate his mind over what Jesus had said. His circumstances were speaking more into his life, into his heart, than he was allowing Jesus to. At that time, that jail cell, the circumstances of his life seemed to be bigger than God himself. Now notice, does Jesus just say, okay, I'll let you go? I'll set you free from that jail cell. No. Nowhere in the text does it say that Jesus changed John's circumstances. And in fact, we would know that John would go on to actually lose his life for the gospel. Jesus doesn't change the circumstances. No, he simply reminds John, I'm sovereign over those circumstances. Verse 23, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Essentially, Jesus is saying, do not be offended. Do not reject me if my plan is not your plan. Do not reject me if my plan is not your plan. It's not for you to know. It's for you to trust. So, when those doubts flood in, when the despairs of life come in, the question is, Will we listen more to our circumstances and the emotion of those circumstances, or will we listen more to the truth of God's Word? Who will we listen to more? And you see, I would say that is why it is so important for us to know and understand who God is. That's why things like theology and doctrine, they matter, because the more we know God, the better we can trust and rest in Him. I remember one of my seminary classes, I walked in one day, and we were going to have a guest lecture, a guest professor who was a pastor in Georgia. I walked in, and he was sitting there, and just looked like a guy to me. Nothing special, just a normal, average guy. Then they introduced him. I learned his name was Jeff Strooker. If you've ever watched the movie Black Hawk Down, you would recognize who Jeff Strooker is. He was one of the heroes of the Battle of Mogadishu. There when things went south there in the movie, this was the actual hero, not the actor. He was the one that when lives were on the line, he would drive into enemy fire, into enemy territory to save those that were her fellow soldiers. He shared with us that the reason why he did that was because he knew that if they lost their lives, that he didn't know where they would spend eternity, but he did not fear death, and so therefore because of Christ, he went into enemy territory and saved countless lives that night. When I learned that, my entire perspective of this average normal looking guy changed dramatically. I went from just a normal guy to being in awe of, man, right here is a war hero that have saved countless lives. What changed? He was sitting there the whole time. What changed was my knowledge and understanding of who he is. And I would say the same is true of our understanding of God. God is here. God is sovereign over all things. What we need to do is better understand and know who He is. The more we sit in awe of Him, the better we can rest in His power and in His strength. So, 
when those emotions hit, when those doubts come in, we recognize that emotions can be very deceiving. And the question is never, how do you feel? The question should be, what do you know? That when our circumstances say give up, we say, God, this is what you have told me. I will cling to your promises. That we would be like we saw last week, that man that builds his house on the rock, on the truth of who God is, that when the circumstances and storms of life come, we would remain firm and we would not be blown over. Essentially, as one author said, when circumstances of life come in, the way to happiness is to answer your doubts with the evidence of who Jesus is. Essentially, doubt your doubts. Doubt your doubts. Don't trust those doubts. Instead, allow those doubts to push you to God's Word, to push you in prayer, to push you to ground your life on the truth of who God is. So today, it may be that we pray, God, I may not feel like following you. My circumstances seem to say, give up, but I believe that your word is true, that you are faithful. Therefore, I know you and I will trust you. And no matter what comes, blessed be the name of the Lord. This week, I read a very interesting article about Abraham Lincoln. I didn't realize that Lincoln, it was said in this article, that till nearly the age of 40, had great doubts about God. Even at times being cynical of who God was. But it says what drew him to God wasn't prosperity, it was suffering. In 1862, at 53, his 11-year-old son, Willie, at 11 years old, died. It led him to begin having long talks with a Presbyterian pastor. And after several long talks, he said, I was driven to my knees so many times by the overwhelming conviction that I have nowhere else to go. That with the loss of his son and that coupled with the horrors of the Civil War that was taking place as he would go through hospitals and see that the wounded and those that had lost their lives, it led him to a firm belief in the providence and sovereignty of God. In fact, in his second inaugural address, one month before he was assassinated, you could feel his trust in God's sovereignty. It's interesting that he didn't make God a supporter of the Union or the Confederacy. No, he has his own purpose. Notice what he says. Lincoln said, Fondly we hope, and fervently we do pray, that this mighty scourge of war might speedily pass away, Yet, if God wills that it continue, until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid with another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still must be said today that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He would go on to make this very profound statement that we cannot believe that He who made the world still governs it today. This reminds us of the beautiful theme of Luke. The gospel is for all people. It is for the elite. It is for those in great authority. It is for the servant and the lowly. It is for those with great grief as the widow. And it is for those, even those that call themselves Christians, that struggle with doubt and uncertainty. It is for the Jew, the Greek, the male, the female, the young and old, if we would simply put our faith and trust in Him and in His sovereignty today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You for this time together. Lord, recognizing that no matter how long, no matter how hard we try to wrap our mind around Your sovereignty, we will never fully comprehend who You are. And today, God, I'm thankful that You remind us that that's okay. It is not for us to know, it is for us to trust. And Lord, I would say that in my life, I have learned that nothing is more freeing than that. And so God, today I pray that for that person here in this room that is so beaten and struggling with all the, the things of life, so weighed down it seems like by circumstances, that today you would remind them that you are sovereign, even over the difficult times. But Lord, you have compassion on us today. 
just as you had compassion on us on the cross, that if we would repent and trust in you, we would have everlasting life. So God, we simply remind ourselves that you are sovereign. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Now as we enter into a time of response, my challenge as always is simply do not leave here without walking in obedience. Whether that is to simply sit there, not even stand, just sit and sit in awe of God's sovereignty. Whether it's to come and pray, whether it's to come and join and be a part of our church family, whether it's to come and give your life to Christ or there in the pew, whatever the case is, my challenge, do not leave here today without trusting in the sovereignty of God. Would you stand and would you sing?